Number one, determine the limit by substitution. So we're going to take the 2 and we're going to substitute it in for each of our x's. So that'll be 2 cubed plus 5 times 2 squared minus 7 times 2 plus 1. Now, if you want to, you can just plug this in the calculator straight away and get an answer. The alternative to that is to do it by hand, and then you would want to be careful. The biggest or easiest place to mess up is right here, because we would want to do 2 squared, which is 4, times 5, and get 20. You don't do 5, time two, five times 2 first. You want to do 2 squared and get 4 times 5 and get 20. So then the rest of this would be 8, and then this will be negative 14, and then plus 1. And if I add those together, 28 minus 14 is 14, plus 1 is 15, so our answer is 15. So in case you don't remember, our answers to limits are either going to be a number of some sort, they can be infinity or negative infinity, and they can also be does not exist, which we abbreviate with D and E. Those are our options for limits as far as answers go. On number two, we want to determine the limit algebraically. Well, when you see the word algebraically, one of the things that at some point you know, maybe you should relate to that is factoring. So like the top of this, I can factor into two parentheses. So this is going to be the limit as x goes to negative 10 still. And on top, we're going to say what multiplies to get 10 that adds to get 11. So that would be plus 10 and plus 1. And so the reason we did that is because if I look at this, now I can cancel something out. The x plus 10 and the x plus 10 are the same, they cancel, and so now that I don't have a denominator anymore, I can look at my limit again and say, now I can plug in negative 10. If, because if you, if you may have tried it before looking at the video, like if I put negative 10 in for my x's up here, I end up with 0 over 0, which is bad. But 0 over 0 usually happens when we can factor and do something to fix it. So we factored, we canceled out, now I'm going to plug in negative 10 where x is and get an answer of negative 9. On number 3, we want to look at the graph of this limit. And so the thing we need to remember is that whenever it has this negative up in like the exponent zone, where exponents normally are, that negative means from the negative. Like that's the direction we're coming from. And then the positive here means that we're from the positive. And so what we need to do is say, well, our, our limits are asking us basically as our x gets close to something, what is our y value? So it says as x goes to negative 1 from the negative direction. So as I'm coming from the negative, I want to think about as I get close to negative 1, which is right here, as I get close to this value, well, I, since I'm coming from the left, I'm going to look right here where that open circle is. The open circle would matter if they were asking us what f of negative 1 is. But since it's a limit, we'd say, oh, from the, from the left side, it's getting really, really close to negative 2. So my answer to the first part of this is negative 2. And then I would look at negative 1 from the positive direction. So I'm going to come from the positive. And then as I get close to this negative 1, I'm going to say, well, that's right here at negative 7. On number 4, it says find the limit if it exists. It doesn't tell us to use substitution or to do it algebraically. So chances are that we'll either want to graph it or, you know, there's actually another way of doing this where we just remember some rules. But if I look at the graph, what's important is that I look, because it says x goes to positive infinity, I need to look at this not at not at 0 and not at 5 and not at even 10 really, but I need to look at this like way as far to the right as I can. So I want to look at it like way this way, even bigger than 20 in some ways. Or you can do this by going to your table of values on your calculator and scrolling down until you get to bigger numbers. And if you do that, either way, what we should see is that as I'm going this way, my y values are getting closer and closer to 0. So that's how I would approach this if I look at the graph. There's another way of doing it where we look at our leading 
terms, x squared over x cubed, and I would call this bottom heavy, because x cubed is bigger, that's not heavy, bottom heavy, because x cubed is bigger than x squared, and since it's bottom heavy, then that always results in our limit being zero. If, if the bottom exponent is bigger than all of the exponents on top, our limit has to be zero. If they're the same, uh, and that's the other case that would be common, like if we had uh, something that looked like this, where my um, exponents are the same, well that's where we can just take the leading coefficients and say that that limit uh, either from either directions of infinity or positive infinity, that limit would just be two-thirds. And again, we can look at the graph, but on the graph of this, it might be pretty difficult to tell exactly what that fraction is. So if it's bottom heavy, it's zero. If it's equal, you just take the numbers in front. Top heavy is a weird situation. If you have the top is bigger than the bottom, then what happens is your answer will either be positive infinity or negative infinity, depending on what it is. Because that those are the graphs we get that look really weird because they're like slant asymptotes kind of like this. Let's see how good of a picture I can draw. Like if I go to the right on this, if I follow this along, like I'm going up to positive infinity. If I went to the left toward negative infinity, I'd be going down to negative infinity. So those are all of the cases we could get on a problem like that. Um, and so you could make some notes about this on a formula sheet. You couldn't put specific examples, but you could say like bottom heavy and equal and then top heavy and give yourself some information about that to go with it. On five, again, one way to do this is to look at the graph. Probably that's a pretty standard way of doing this. If I want to look at negative three, that's right here on my graph, right here in the middle where I have an asymptote, not right in the middle, almost in the middle, where my asymptote is. And so the deal is, is if I approach from this direction, from the left, then my graph is going up as I get closer and closer to negative 3. So as I come from the left, it's going towards positive infinity. But if I look from the right, then it's going down toward negative infinity. And so the issue is, those aren't the same thing. If I go one direction and get one answer, and then from the other direction I get a different answer, that's when our limit does not exist you can abbreviate with D and E, but it does not exist. On number six, we are trying to find the intervals on which the function is continuous, and then on seven, we're trying to find the points of discontinuity and identify the type of discontinuity. And so those are really similar questions, and I went ahead and pulled up the graphs so you can see what they look like, but on both of these, we actually don't have to use the graphs at all, it kind of depends on you and your preference uh, as far as whether or not you want to do this algebraically or graphically. So, uh, or your teacher's preference. I don't really care at the moment. So, if I'm your teacher, there you go. So, what we're going to do is we're going to factor anything we can on here. And so, I can factor the bottom so that this is x minus 3 and, and, um, x minus 1 and what I want to do is set the bottom equal to 0 because my points of discontinuity happen where the denominator of a fraction equals 0 and so if I do that I get x equals 1 and 3 and so that's what's happening over here on my graph I have an asymptote here at 1 and an asymptote over here at 3 and then I have my graph right here that's going up, and then I have this graph, and then this graph. And so, oh look, it kind of looks like a frowny face. Um, and so that means that everywhere except 1 and 3, I have values. So the way I write that in interval notation is I go negative infinity, comma, and I pick which one's on the left, 1 or 3. 1 is farther to the left. And then I'm going to go between 1 and 3. And then I'm going to go from 3 to infinity. Now the reason that interval notation works this way is because these parentheses we have are saying I can get right up to 1, but I'm not equal to 1. Being equal to 1, remember, is where we put a bracket around it. Um, and that's not what we're doing here. So 
that's why this works the way it does, this, this interval notation that we've got going on. On 7, again, we can use the graph to help us, but this one, this time it's a little trickier because we want to set, we want to factor anything we can. And I get x minus 4 over um, if I factor this into two parentheses, it's x minus 4, x minus 2. And so what's important here is that my x minus 4s would cancel. And so where the bottom equals 0, both of these places are discontinuities. But because one of them cancels, that's a different kind of discontinuity. Where x minus 4 equals 0 is x equals 4. And if I look at my graph over here at 4, I don't have an asymptote. It doesn't look like anything's happening. But if I were to zoom in or like look at my table of values at 4, I have an error. So this is called a hole or the official like way of saying it is that it's a removable discontinuity. It's a removable discontinuity because if I could just fill in that hole, then it wouldn't be discontinuous. So it's like I can it's like a pothole that we could just fill in and then it wouldn't be an issue. But here at x minus 2 equals 0, I can't fix that by canceling because there's nothing to cancel. So I get x x equals 2 which on my graph is an asymptote, and we call that an infinite discontinuity. Those are the two types that we usually see in graphs. There's technically one more, but your functions have to look really weird to make those happen. The other one is called a jump discontinuity, and that's where like our graph is down here and then like literally jumps without like and that's not an asymptote or anything happening, it's just the graph jumped up or jumps down. Number eight, average rate of change of the function over the given interval. Uh, if you take anything away from this class, is that rate of change is slope and the average rate of change is quite literally the slope between three and five. Three and five are our x values. So they would go in separate points. And so what we need to do is figure out what the y values are. And to do that, we plug in our x values to our function. So 3 squared plus 6 times 3 is 27. And then 5 squared plus 6 times 5 is 55. Now that we have our two points, we either need to use the formula f of b minus f of a over b minus a and so that's where like this is a and this is b this is f of a and f of b or we might write down y2 I mean not write down we might use the good old slope formula we know and love from algebra 1 and algebra 2 y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 just to point that out real quick, these are formulas that you could put on a formula sheet if you're allowed one. So, and you might write average rate of change so you know when to use those. Either way, we're going to end up with 55 minus 27 over 5 minus 3. 55 minus 27 is 28. 5 minus 3 is 2. I divide those and get 14. So, yeah, 14. That's my slope, my average rate of change over the given interval. Okay, so number nine gives us a formula to use, and we're going to plug in what they gave us. We have f of x equals negative nine over x, and a equals negative eight. So what I want to do is plug into this formula. So you're going to want to write small because there's not a lot of room on your review. Uh, and I have lots of room, so I don't really have to worry about that as much. And so if you're writing as big as I am, then it might be a problem. So a is negative 8. So I'm going to put f of negative 8 plus h minus f of negative 8 over h. What f of negative 8 plus h means because remember, normally we have f of x's, and then this is negative 9 over x. But if I want to do f of negative 8 plus h, what I'm doing is taking what x normally is, and I'm putting 
negative 8 plus h in its spot. So x is on bottom, I'm going to put negative 8 plus h on bottom. So this will be limit as h goes to 0. Sorry, that's a bad h. So this is negative 9 over negative 8 plus h minus, and now I'm going to plug in negative 8, so negative 9 over negative 8 over h. Now I want to get common denominators. Actually, before I get common denominators, this negative and this negative can cancel each other out. And then it's still negative overall, though, because we basically had three negatives, which makes us negative overall. I want to get a common denominator. So I multiply the first fraction by the second denominator. So multiply it by 8. Multiply the second fraction by the first denominator, negative 8 plus h. And so on the top of this, I get negative 72 for um, this, this part, this part right here, negative 72. And then I'm going to have to distribute this negative and the 9 into this set of parentheses. So that's going to be positive 72 minus 9h. We're and then we're over our common denominator, which is 8 times negative 8 plus h over h. Now, negative 72 plus 72 cancel. So I have on top of this negative 9h over. You can distribute the 8 or you can leave it. If you distribute, that's negative 64 plus 8h. If you leave it undistributed, it's totally fine. But at this point, we need to say, okay, the h on the bottom is really h over 1. So let's flip that up and multiply as 1 over h and get it off the bottom. And that means I can cancel out these h's and get negative uh, 9 over negative 64 plus 8h. And then plug that h in. Sorry, h is 0. We haven't been plugging it in because this whole time up here, and here, and here, and even here, h, there was just an h on the bottom. If I plugged in h as 0, I'd get undefined. But now, because of where my h is on bottom, it's not alone on bottom. So I can plug in 0, and I'll get an answer. So negative 9 over negative 64 plus 8 times 0. Well, that gives me negative 9 over 64, I mean negative 9 over negative 64, which is positive 9 over 64. I'm doing this slightly out of order. Last one was 9 and this one's 14. I want to dig, like, get these out of the way because they're actually similar and I put them as 9 and 14 so that they'd be next to each other, like, horizontally. Um, so, yeah, the limit this time... Our formula is different. We're going to do x approaches a, so x approaches 3, because a is 3. And then I have f of x minus f of a, so f of 3, over x minus a, so over x minus 3. So when I plug this in, first I'm just going to have f of x, which is just our function as is, minus, I'm going to plug in 3, to my function, that's what f of 3 is, and it's usually easier if you do that like out to the side or in your calculator because it makes it easier to not accidentally uh, screw up this whole minus situation. So 6 times 3 squared plus 9 times 3 gives us 81, so I'm going to put minus 81 over x minus 3. Now what I'm trying to do, because right now if I tried to plug in 3, I get 0 on the bottom. I want to factor the top to see if I can get the x minus 3 on bottom to cancel with something on the top. So in order for us to do that, first I should check and see if they all have a number in common on top. They do. They all have a 3. So let's take out the 3. That looks a little nicer now. A little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to 
basically slide and divide now. Um, and if your teacher may do different things with you for factoring in this, like the idea is that I need to factor this into two parentheses. And so we're asking ourselves like how to split 2x squared up. And so at some point, eventually, our answer is going to show that we've got 2x and x. The reason I like to use slide and divide is because now I need to know what, how would I split up negative 27 into these spots so that my outer and inner terms, when I multiply them together, give me a positive 3. And that, a lot of times, is tricky. So that's why I like to use slide and divide. In order for us to use slide and divide, we're going to slide the 2 and get x squared plus 3x minus 54. And so I need to know what multiplies to get negative 54, that adds to get 3, or subtracts to get 3. And so I get x plus 9 and x minus 6. But I have to remember, and this is one of the drawbacks of slide and divide, I have to remember to divide by the 2 that I slid earlier. So if you're solving an equation, you don't have to really remember to move the 2. But if I'm actually just factoring, this 2 needs to go back in front of x. So I need 2x plus 9 in one parentheses, and I need just x minus 3 in the other. Hey, look at that. We got x minus 3. So those are going to cancel. And so now all I have is 3 times 2x plus 9. I don't have a fraction anymore. I can plug that 3 in. And so that will make it not a limit anymore. Uh, 3 times 2 times 3 plus 9. So that's going to give me 6 plus 9, which is 15, 3 times 15, which is 4 to 5. On 10 and 11, our instructions are the same. They say find an equation of the tangent line to the graph of f of x at, and then it tells us a point to use. And so when we did this initially, uh, we used the formulas like we used on 9 or 14 to find the slope. And so since we know how to take a derivative now, um, I'd say we just do the shortcut. On 9 and 14, it told you specifically to use those formulas, So, uh, but these are different. They don't tell us to use that formula. So what we're going to do is we're trying to write the equation of a tangent line. A line in general uh, needs a point and a slope for point-slope form. So that formula, which you can write on your formula sheet if you want to, is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So what we're going to do is find m, our slope, by taking the derivative. So I have f of x equals x squared minus x. So the derivative of that is 2x minus 1. And so we've, we've done that a whole bunch over the last little part of the semester. But what's a little different is now we're going to find the slope specifically at 3 by plugging 3 in to our derivatives. So that's kind of where this is a little different than what we're used to. It's kind of exciting. So 2 times 3 is 6, minus 1 is 5. So that is our slope, m. So I know what x is supposed to be, like x1. Um, and I know what m is supposed to be, I just need to find y. And so to find y, I have to plug into my original equation. So f of 3 equals 3 squared minus 3, which is 9 minus 3, which is 6. So that's going to be y1. I'm going to plug these all in together into point slope and circle my answer. So y minus... 6 equals uh, 5 times x minus 3. You can solve that for y if you want to, but it's also okay to just leave it. So it's totally up to you. Um, on 11, we're going to do the same exact process. So I'm going to take the derivative and get 3x squared minus 36 and then I'm going to plug in 6 
I'm going to go 3 times 6 squared minus 36, which is 72. That's a really big number, but there's no rule that says we can't have a big number for slope. So x1 is 6, m is 72. We have to plug into our original equation. I was using f, and this is really y, so I mean it doesn't really matter, but when I plug 6 in, 6 cubed minus 36 times 6 minus 4, that gives us negative 4 for y1. And so now we're ready to just plug it in. So y minus a negative 4 is really y plus 4 equals 72 times x minus 6. That's our answer. So the next thing is the same kind of problem except instead of a tangent line we've got a normal line. So we have to remember that normal line means the line that's perpendicular. And so the difference is that we're going to do the reciprocal of our slope and change this sign and that's the slope of our normal line. So it starts off the same way. I want to find the derivative of y, so that's 6 x. I'm going to plug in the x value, so 6 times negative 4 is negative 24. So that is the slope of the line that's tangent at negative 4 comma 48, but what I want is perpendicular, so I flip it and make it positive and get 1 over 24. Then that's m. This time I already have x and y for my points, so that's nice. So this is y minus 48 equals 1 over 24 times x plus 4. That is my answer. Um, same thing on 13. So y prime is 5 minus 4x. I'm going to plug in 3. So 5 minus 4 times 3, so 5 minus 12, which is negative 7. And then I'm going to flip that and change the sign. It's negative 7, so that's going to make it positive 1 7 for m. We already have our point here. So this is y minus a negative 3, so y plus 3 equals 1 over 7. I'm not sure why I just started writing m. 1 over 7, x minus 3. Okay, um, on 15 through 18, they are asking us if the function is not diff... or they're saying if the function is not differentiable at the given value of x, tell whether the problem is a corner cusp, vertical tangent, or discontinuity. So. Uh, what we would probably want to do is graph these and just take a look at what they look like so that we know. So 15, the graph of 15 is this graph up here that I already have um, in orange. And so that graph comes like to a, a point down here, like the kind of point you could um, like prick your finger on. That is called a cusp. Um, it looks like a bird. So if you remember a bird, something that looks like a bird or an open book is a cusp, um, then um, that maybe will help. If I graph 16, oh, whoops. If I graph 16, wait for it. Oh, I get this graph right here. So 16, and it's kind of far down, so you will only see a little bit of it if you have a standard window. But this is a corner because um, we have two like sides like meeting, almost like this is a triangle, but we call it a corner. So 16 is a corner. Uh, next, number 17 is this graph right here. So this is a vertical tangent because here in the middle, if I had a tangent line that I was trying to draw, it would be a vertical line. So that's a vertical tangent. And then the one that I think is easiest to see, because we're used to seeing it the most, is like 18, which is now down here 
at the bottom. 18 is what we would call a discontinuity because it has an asymptote. So those are our four ways of being discontinuous for functions and so that's an example of each so that you can remember them. 19 says find the values where the function is not differentiable. So we're looking for those things from 15 through 18, corner cusp, um, vertical tangent, or discontinuity. Well, here's a corner, there's a corner, everywhere is a corner, corner. Um, so that's happening at x equals negative 2 and at x equals positive 2. All right, here we go with derivatives. Find dy over dx. So that just means find the first derivative. And on 20, we're just going to use the power rule, the rule where we multiply by the exponent and then subtract one from the exponent. So on 20, that's going to give us 16, because we have 4 times 4. Subtract one from 4 and get x cubed. And then minus 9 times 3 is 27 take one off of three and get squared and then when we have just a number and we take the derivative we get zero and instead of writing plus zero we just leave it off so our answer is 16 x cubed minus 27 x squared now I'm going to do 21 which gives us a hint that we need to use the product rule so on the product rule that's 1d2 plus 2d1, which means you write down the first thing and then take the derivative of the second thing plus the second thing times the derivative of the first thing. So I'm going to write down 2x minus 4 and then I'm going to take the derivative of this second parentheses, which I'm going to use the power rule for. So 2 times 3 is 6, so that's 6x squared minus 2x, that's the derivative of the second thing, plus 2d1. So I'm going to write down this whole second thing times the derivative of the first thing, which is just the number in front of x, which is 2. Now I need to distribute and add like terms, and then I'll be done. Or in the case of this first thing, I'm going to FOIL, actually. So that'll give me 12x cubed minus 4x squared minus 24x squared plus 8x. That's foiling the first thing. Then I need to distribute the 2 on the second part of this. So plus 4x cubed minus 2x squared plus 2. Add my like terms. So I've got 12x cubed plus 4x cubed, which is 16x cubed. Then I have negative 4x squared, negative 24x squared, and negative 2x squared, which together makes negative 30x squared. And then 8x and plus 2. That should be my answer. Product rule again. So same rule, 1d2 plus 2d1. So this is my first thing and this is my second thing. So I write down 2x cubed plus 3 and then times that by 35x to the 6 and then plus and I do 5x to the 7th minus 4 times the derivative of the first thing which is 6x squared. I'm going to distribute into both of these parentheses, so I get 70x to the 9th plus 105x to the 6th plus 30x to the 9th minus 24x squared. And then I'm going to add like terms, which are the x to the 9th, so that's 100x to the 9th plus 105 x to the 6 minus 24x squared. Another way that you can do 21 and 22, by the way, is you could FOIL or distribute or whatever them out so that you just add a polynomial and then just use the power rule. 
it's kind of hit or miss which of the ways of doing that is easier. So um, it's kind of up to you, but you have to do one or the other. You can't just like make up your own rule for finding the derivative. You either have to multiply out and use the power rule or leave it alone and do the product rule. So 23 and 24 use the quotient rule because they're fractions. And so I'm going to do low d high minus high d low over the square of the one below. So this is my formula I'm using. And it, it rhymes, so that makes it easier to have memorized or whatever. But that means that I need to know which is the top and which is the bottom. So the top of this is high, the bottom is low. Now I'm just going to fill this in. So I'm going to start off with the bottom, 2x minus 2, and then times that by the derivative of the top. The derivative of x is the number that's in front of x, which is just 1. Minus, that's an important thing to remember, is it's minus on top. High, which is x, times the derivative of the bottom, which is just 2, over the square of the one below, so over 2x minus 2 squared. I would distribute the 1, which doesn't really change anything, and then x times 2 is 2x, so minus 2x. And then we typically don't mess with the bottom because we want to um, wait and see if the top maybe will factor so we can cancel something out. This gives us negative 2 over 2x minus 2 squared. Technically, if we wanted to, we can cancel out all of the 2s, not the squared, but all of the 2s and say that this is negative 1 over... Um, x minus 1 in parentheses squared, but um, that's kind of a stretch, like I didn't, I didn't even think about that until somebody pointed out to me that, yeah, they all have 2's, and so if we, if we did FOIL this out, then everything would be divisible by 2, and so because of that we can just divide everything by 2, and it still equals the same thing, but remember that only works if everything will divide by whatever number you're talking about. If there's one thing anywhere that won't, then you can't do that. So, quotient rule again. So we have a top and a bottom. And we're going to do 6 minus 9x times the derivative of the top, which is 2x minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is negative 9, over 6 minus 9x squared. We're going to distribute the 2x. Negative x squared times negative 9 is positive 9x squared. And then I add my like terms here and get 12x minus 9x squared. So this one actually turns out to be like the last one. All of these are divisible by 3. So technically we should be able to divide everything by 3. Um, you'd uh, want to check with your teacher about that though. Like normally with the quotient rule, we just leave it, leave the bottom alone, and we only worry about stuff canceling if, like, if the top could be factored so that we could completely cancel something out. But, um, like, you could if you wanted to take this to 4x minus 3x squared over 2 minus 3x squared. But you couldn't go any further because now nothing divides into everything. 25. So this is a power rule again. It has a negative exponent, which just means we need to be careful. If I multiply by negative 2, I get negative 32. When I subtract 1 from negative 2, that gives me negative 3. So when I have negative exponents, my exponent gets more negative because I'm subtracting 1. And then the rest of this is just normal power rule. So 
I get this as my answer. And then there's just another one that's similar to that. So this is 10x plus 7, and then I multiply by negative 3 and get negative 6. Subtract 1 and get negative 4. Find the fourth derivative. So these are kind of fun to do. So the first derivative of this is going to be 42x to the fifth minus 12x cubed plus 8 x, because I'm just using the power rule, multiplying by the power and then subtracting one. But we want the fourth derivative, so y with an apostrophe called y prime, that's our first derivative. y with two apostrophes is our second derivative and is y double prime. What I do is I take the derivative of the first derivative and that's how I keep going with this. So I'm going to, the, the worst part of this is I'm going to get some big numbers, like this is 210 x to the fourth minus 36 x squared plus 8, and then y triple prime, I times 210 by 4 and get 840x cubed minus 72x, and then the plus 8 turns into 0, so it goes away. And then whenever I do y in the fourth prime, instead of putting 4 marks, we usually put 4 in parentheses because that's a lot of marks to make, so this is 2, 5, 2, 0, x squared minus 72. And that's the answer to my fourth derivative. Velocity is our graph here, and they ask us some questions. So we have to understand what velocity is telling us and what these questions are asking. So when is the body's acceleration equal to zero? Acceleration is the derivative of velocity, or the slope of velocity. So where is the slope of our graph zero? Well, that happens up here and down here, and so we're going to write the time that that happens, which is from 2 to 3, and from 6 to 8. So if you need to, like, draw some lines to... Make sure you get the right numbers there. There we go. What is the body's greatest velocity? Well, it's basically asking us what the number is, what number it reaches that's farthest from zero. And so we would look at the highest place and the lowest place, and whichever one of those is farther away gets it. And so up here at the top where we're at four feet per second is greater than down at the bottom, which is negative two. If this had been flipped and like we'd had negative 4 and positive 2, the negative 4 feet per second would have been greatest. The negative and the positive just tell us about the direction that it's going. Speaking of which, when does the body reverse direction? Well, that's when it switches from negative to positive or positive to negative. And so that happens here at 5 and at 9. Given the distance function s of t, find the velocity and the acceleration. So this just requires us to remember the relationship between these. Velocity is the first derivative of position. So I take the derivative, get 2t plus 7. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So I take the derivative again and just get 2. And so there's my velocity and acceleration function. We are going to use trig functions now, and so those are things you either need like a formula sheet or to have memorized. So I have x to the 6th times tangent x, which means I'm going to use the product rule. The x to the 6th part of this is the first thing. Tangent x is the second thing. So 1 d2, the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x plus 2, which is tangent x times the derivative of x to the 6, which is 6x to the 5th. All we can really do now is just like move this in front of tangent and then like write it without the multiplication dots. So wait, what am I, what am I trying to write there? x to the 6 secant squared x plus 6x to the 5th tangent x. That's my answer. 
So you probably looked at that product rule and were like, oh no, that really wasn't that bad of a product rule, if you ask me. This one doesn't have any rules, we just have a trig function we'll have to deal with. So x to the 8th is 8x to the 7th, minus the derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. And so I'm going to put both of those right here. The derivative of 6 is 0, so this is my answer. There's two different ways of going about this problem. One is to use the quotient rule, so we'll do that first. We do low, which is tangent, d high. Now this is important. The derivative of 3 is 0. Normally we just don't write the derivative of a number, but because of the multiplication symbol here, we have to write that that's times 0 because it's going to make this first part go away. Minus high d low, so the derivative of tangent is secant squared over the square of the one below, so over tangent squared. So to simplify this, I would just get rid of that because it's 0, so this is negative 3 secant squared x over tangent squared x. The other way of doing this requires us to remember some trig identities. If tangent x is on the bottom, that's like having cotangent x on top. So what we can do is say that this is really like y equals 3 cotangent x, and then just take the derivative of 3 cotangent x, which because it's just a 3 and not 3x, we don't even need the product rule. The derivative of this uh, is just negative 3 cosecant squared x. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared, and so then we just need the 3 to be with it. Now these are actually the same, and here's why. We can use identities basically on this and say that secant squared is really like cosine squared on the bottom of a fraction. Tangent squared is sine squared over cosine squared. And so we flip the fraction up and multiply so that we can try to combine things or cancel things out. The cosines cancel and I get negative 3 over sine squared, which sine squared on bottom is like cosecant squared on top. So that's a throwback to pre-calculus uh, or trigonometry from last year where you had to do all of those things. So either way of going about that works. Obviously this way gets you there to this nice simpler answer faster. So yeah. On 33 we want to find y double prime if y equals 4 cosine x. So I'm going to take the first, oops, I'm going to take the first derivative, y prime, and so because it's just a 4, I don't need to use the product rule. I just need to say what's the derivative of cosine x, which is negative sine x, and I put the 4 in front, so this is negative 4 sine x. It's the first derivative. The second derivative, I do the same thing. The derivative of sine x is cosine x, so this is negative 4 cosine x. And if we kept taking the derivative, like it would just switch back and forth between sine and cosine and negative and positive and stuff. So 34 through 37 are supposed to have instructions that say to just find dy over dx. And it was supposed to have a hint that you're going to use the chain rule. Those instructions got deleted. So uh, now you know. On 34, we have y equals sine to the 6th x, and it might be helpful for us to rewrite that as sine x to the 6th power, because we're going to chain rule this. Then minus cosine of 5x, so it might help if you put a parenthesis around 5x, because when we're chain ruling, what we need to know is the inside and the outside. So like on sine x to the 6th, the inside is sine x, the outside is to the 6th power. When we chain rule, we do the outside, the derivative of the outside. So that would be 6 sine x to the 5th. And we times it by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of sine x is cosine x. So that's the first part, minus. Now I'm going to take the derivative of cosine of 5x. So the outside part of this is the cosine, and the inside part is the 5x. So I take the derivative of cosine and get negative sine, so that changes that to plus and gives me sine. The important thing is that that 5x has to stay inside. So on our 
and then I'm going to times by the derivative of the inside, which will be 5. So on our formula sheet, we have like d over dx of cosine x equals sine x, negative sine x, I mean. Let me just erase that. And so what's important for us to know is whatever is here has to be here. So since it's cosine of 5x, it has to be sine of 5x. Then we times it by the derivative of 5x, which is 5. So now this is, if I rewrite it, I'm going to re-put this um, exponent where it's supposed to be, 6 sine to the 5th x cosine x. I'm going to move the 5 in front, so that's plus 5 sine 5x. Five and you can't, like, uh, you can't mess with what's inside. Like, I can't do 5 times 5x and get 25x inside. It doesn't... It doesn't work like that, so don't try to do that. That would be, that'd be bad. 35, we want to change this to an exponent of 1 half, because it's a square root, and that's the exponent for square roots. I'm going to chain rule this, so that's a 1 half times 6 plus sine 2x. I'm going to subtract 1 and get negative 1 half. And times it by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of 6 is 0. The derivative of sine of 2x will be cosine 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is 2. So this is actually like a chain rule with a peanut. I mean, an M&M &M with a peanut. There's two chain rules happening. So 1 half times 2 is 1. And then I just need to rewrite this. And then I'm done with that. 36 is a chain rule. We have 6 and then cotangent x is to the fourth power. So we're going to multiply the 6 and the 4 together and get 24 cotangent x. Subtract a power and get 3. Then times that by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. Since there's not like a 2x or anything, I don't have to keep going with that. So the only thing I would probably do to rewrite this is put the negative at the very front with the 24 and then write cotangent cubed x cosecant squared x. 37, the square root's on the bottom, so when I rewrite this to start off, I move it to the top, which gives it a negative exponent, and it's a square root, so it's a half. So together, that gives you negative 1 half, because I'm doing two things. Moving it to the top, which gives it a negative exponent, changing it from a square root, which is a half. Now I'm going to chain rule this, so I'm going to multiply by negative 1 half. The inside stays the same. Subtract 1 from negative 1 half and get negative 3 halves. And then times by the derivative of the inside, which is negative 8. So that means I'm going to do negative 1 half times negative 8, which is 4 in front times 7 minus 8x to the negative 3 halves. Uh, implicit differentiation is where when I take the derivative of y, I have to put dy over dx next to it. So the derivative of 3y is 3 times dy over dx. The derivative of negative 6x squared is minus 12x. The derivative of x is just 1. The derivative of negative 5 is 0, which is kind of a big deal. Don't accidentally put the negative 5 back there. That's bad. I want to solve for dy over dx, and so I'm going to add 12x to both sides, and then divide by 3. And when I divide by 3, I need to make sure to remember that I can't like actually divide by 3 because they're not all divisible by 3. So I'd leave my answer as 12x plus 1 over 3. 39 has the quotient rule. So I need to take the derivative of 5y to the 4th, which is 20y cubed times dy over dx equals, I'm going to quotient rule this, so that's low, which is x squared plus 4, d high, which is 2x, minus high d low, over the square of the one below. 
So on top of this, I can distribute the two x's. And because of the minus sign in the middle and the minus sign that's like inside our parentheses, those won't be exactly the same, but there will be like terms and we will be able to cancel something out. So this gives us 2x cubed plus 8x. If I distribute the negative and the 2x at the same time, I get minus 2x cubed plus 8x. So that's x squared plus 4 squared. So I add like terms on top. 2x cubed minus 2x cubed cancels. 8x plus 8x is 16x. x squared plus 4 squared is on the bottom still. So all I have left to do is solve for dy over dx now. So I'm going to divide by 20y cubed. When I divide by 20y cubed, that's really like multiplying by 1 over 20y cubed. So I get dy over dx equals... That's just going to go on the bottom, and I can actually cancel out a 4 from the 16 and the 20. So this is 4x over 5y cubed x squared plus 4 squared. Forty. So the derivative of 9y is 9 dy over dx. Oh look, a product rule. So the first thing is 7x, and then the second thing is the y. And so I'm going to do 1, which is 7x. d2, the derivative of y is 1 dy over dx, or just dy over dx, plus 2, which is y, times the derivative of 7x, which is 7. The rest of this is just 0. The derivative of negative 3, 0. Derivative of 0, 0. You might want to rewrite this a step, or if you just say, okay, this is plus 7y, so I need to subtract 7y from both sides, that would be fine. I'm going to factor out the dy over dx and have 7x plus 9 inside, or 9 plus 7x. I just switched that around for fun. Equals negative 7y, so I need to divide by 7x plus 9. So dy over dx equals negative 7y over 7x plus 9. Um, x to the 6th, the derivative is 6x to the 5th. The derivative of cotangent y is negative cosecant squared y. But because I took the derivative of y, I need to put times dy over dx. So now when I solve, I just need to divide by negative cosecant squared y. And so dy over dx equals that fraction, 6x to the fifth over negative cosecant squared y. These inverse trig function derivatives, you either have to have the formula memorized or have a teacher who's nice enough to let you use a formula sheet, whichever one. So the formula for inverse sine is u prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. So u is 4x cubed, and then u prime is the derivative of that, which is 12x squared. So on top will be 12x squared, on the bottom will be 1 minus u squared, so 4x cubed squared. So the way that works is we're going to square 4 and get 16. We're going to square x cubed, which multiplies the exponent and gives us a 6. So 12x squared over the square root of 1 minus 16x to the 6 is our answer. The formula for cosine is negative of what the formula for sine is. So it's negative u prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. u is 6t, u prime is 6, so just fill that in. And if I square 6t, I get 36t squared, so that's negative 6 over the square root of 1 minus 36t squared. 
tangent, the formula does not have a square root. It's u prime over 1 plus u squared. Now, this one's tricky because of what u is. u is the square root of 11x, which is really like having 11x to the 1 half inside of parentheses, which means I have to use the chain rule. So I have to multiply by a half, and 11x is still inside, and then take that to the nay of 1 half power, because it's 1 half minus 1. But I have to times that by the derivative of, ln, of 11x, which is 11. So u prime is 1 half times 11 is 11 halves, and then 11x to the nay of 1 half. So if I fill that in, that's on top. over 1 plus u squared. It doesn't matter which way you write u. You can write it as square root of 11x or 11x to the 1 half. I think it's easier with the square root because a square root squared goes away. So 11 halves. Times 11x to the negative 1 half over just 1 plus 11x. Then we're going to have to move the 2 down to the bottom and this 11x to the negative 1 half down to the bottom. So we get 11 over 2 times 1 plus 11x times the square root of 11x because 11x to the negative 1 half is a square root on the bottom of our fraction. So that would be our answer. 45 through 49 are exponential functions and logarithmic functions, and so we just have to remember, like, the rules for that. Like, on 45, the derivative of e to some power is e to the u times u prime. So in this case, u is 2x, and u prime is 2, so we just fill it in. So our answer is e to the 2x times 2, and so you can rewrite that where the 2 is in front, so 2e the 2x. When it's a number instead of e, it makes it a little bit more complicated. Our formula is a to u times ln of a times u prime. So u is negative x, u prime is negative 1, and then I'm going to fill this in. So this is 9 to the negative x times ln of 9 times negative 1. Then I'm going to put the negative in front and call it good. Six to the cosine x uses the same formula that we just used on the last one. So u is cosine x, u prime is negative sine x. So if I fill in my formula, this is six to the cosine x times ln of six times negative sine x. Well, as far as the order of this goes, it doesn't really matter a whole lot, but you definitely want to put the negative first. Um, then, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Like, you can put ln of 6 and then sine x, and then 6 to the cosine x. You can put it in any order. Just make sure the negative's in front. When I have natural log of something, my formula is 1 over u times u prime. So u is 2x squared, u prime is 4x, so I'm going to have 1 over 2x squared times 4x. We put the 4x over 1 and multiply, so you can either put them on top of each other and then cancel, or you can cancel out and then put them together, but we should end up with 2 over x as our answer. The formula for a logarithm as opposed to a natural logarithm is 1 over u ln a times u prime. So u on this problem is 16x, u prime is 16. So I'm going to do 1 over 16x ln of 4 times 16, which is not what I just wrote, times 16. So the 16s will cancel, and this will just be 1 over x ln 4. 
Number 50, good old logarithmic differentiation. So this might be the case where you'd want to write down logarithmic differentiation and then write down some tips to help you remember how to do the problem. Not specific examples, but um, like a general, this is what we should do. So for instance, the first thing you should do is take the natural log of both sides. And then the point of us doing that is so that we can move the exponent in front of our natural log. So this is natural log of y equals 7x natural log of x. Now we're going to take the derivative. So the derivative of ln of y, remember our formula is 1 over u times u prime. So our u in this case is y. So this is 1 over y times the derivative of y, which is dy over dx. On the right side, we need to product rule, because 7x is one thing, ln of x is another. So 7x times the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x, plus ln of x times the derivative of 7x, which is 7. Then uh, we're going to simplify on the right side some, like 7x over 1 times 1 over x is 7x over x, so that x is cancel. I'll move the 7 in front, so this is 7 plus 7 ln x. I'm going to times both sides by y, because I want to move that y to the other side, so dy over dx equals 7 plus 7 ln of x. Now, here's something you have to remember. We actually know what y is. y is x to the 7x, so instead of writing y, I'm going to put x to the 7x. Then that's my answer. This is the last step we did, the stuff in chapter 4, so it should be the most familiar to us and hopefully the easiest. If I want the absolute minimum on this graph, I look at what's farthest down to the bottom, which is this point. All I need is the x value, um, although I do, it does look like it's negative 3 comma negative 4, so if you put that, that would be fine. But the answer choice would just have the x value of negative 3. Remember, we want an absolute minimum, so it didn't need to be a relative minimum. Um, it just needed to be the very bottom of our graph. On 52, it says find the extreme values, absolute maximums and minimums, of the function on the interval where they occur. So what I recommend you do is graph this in your calculator, and then we want to just look between 2 and 5. So you could actually change your window if you wanted to, to where your x min is 2 and your x max is 5. Here's my picture on my um, online calculator that I used with the points we need marked. Like, the very top of this graph is our maximum. It's actually a relative and an absolute maximum. And that happens at 3.5 comma 2.25. So we have a max there. Our minimum happens, since I want to look from 2 to 5, I need to figure out what it is at 2 and 5. If one of those was lower than the other, I would just put the lower value, but since they're tied, my minimum is 2, 0, and 5, 0. They're both minimums. 53. We want to find the extreme values. This time they don't give us an interval, so we're looking at all of it. And so this is a really long equation. <laughs> when I plug it in, I get something that's like kind of boring almost and simple. So the absolute max of this is up here at the top, which we can find is 0, 4. By the way, I find that if I can't just tell, like that looks pretty obvious. But you can find that by using second trace, like so on the previous problem, you'd probably use second trace and go to maximum and then do a left bound and a right bound and all of that stuff. But this one's pretty easy to see at 0, 4. Then there is not an absolute minimum because it keeps going down forever and ever and ever. So the difference between this problem and the problem before is the problem before we were just looking at certain values which meant that there was an absolute minimum. But here it's what it's all of the values, and so it keeps going down forever. So we wouldn't say that our absolute minimum is negative infinity, because really that means there isn't an absolute minimum, because it keeps going down forever. Uh, 54 says to use the first derivative of the function to find its relative maximums or minimums. And I have the graph here, because after we find it, 
using the first derivative, we would typically, or we could use the graph to help us then with that. So the derivative of this is 4x minus 14. I'm going to set that equal to 0 and solve. So I'm going to add 14 and divide by 4, which gives me 14 over 4, which is 7 over 2. Once I have that, that's where I either need to just think about this function, like this is a parabola opening up, so this has to be a minimum, or the other way of doing it would be to look at the graph and look and say, oh yeah, that does look like a minimum. And then we can leave it as 7 halves and plug in 7 halves and get a fraction as our y value of 19 over 2, or we can just write it as decimals as 3.5 comma 9.5, whichever. But we do need to say that it's a minimum, not a maximum, because, I mean, there's a difference there. 55 has the same instructions, so we need to take the first derivative set it equal to 0 so that we can solve to factor this so we can solve, I personally would use slide and divide and say what multiplies to get negative 60, that adds to get negative 4 which is negative 10 and positive 6 and then I divide both of these numbers by what I slid, which is 3. So this is really 3x minus 10 and x plus 2. And I set those equal to 0 and solve, and that gives me my x values for my maxes and mins. And then I either need to plug into my function and try to figure out which one is a max and which one is a min, or look at my graph and see. So on my graph, I can see that my maximum is at negative 2. And I could press trace and type in negative 2, and my calculator will tell me the y value is 24. My minimum is 3.33, which is 10 thirds, comma, negative 51.85. And... Um, I don't actually know what that is as a fraction, uh, but it's probably something over 27 and kind of unpleasant to get if you want to go for it. Use the first derivative of each function and a number line to find those values of x for which the given function is increasing and those values for x which, for which it is decreasing. We're going to take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve. So I get x equals 5 6. I'm going to put that on my number line, pick a number to the left, which is something like 0, a number to the right, something like 1, and plug it back into this and say whether it's positive or negative. When I plug in 0, I get 0 minus 5, which is a negative number. When I plug in 1, I get a positive minus I get a positive 6 minus 5, which is a positive number. So it's increasing where it's positive, which is from 5, 6 to infinity. It's decreasing where it's negative which is from negative infinity to 5 6. 57, first derivative is 108 minus 3x squared, set it equal to 0. I get 108 equals 3x squared, divide by 3 and get, uh, divide by 3 and get 36 equals x squared and square root both sides so x is positive and negative 6. That positive and negative thing is kind of a big deal because otherwise you screw up and get this wrong and that would be bad. So I want to pick numbers in these intervals. When I plug negative 10 in up here I get a negative. When I plug in 0 I get positive. When I plug in 10 I get negative. So it's increasing from negative 6 to 6 and it's decreasing everywhere else so from negative infinity to negative 6 and from 6 to infinity. Alright, second derivative test. So I'm going to take two derivatives. My first one is 2x plus 2. My second one is 2. I can't really use the number line because I'm 2 equals 0 doesn't solve and give me anything for x. And so that means this is either concave up the whole time or concave down the whole time. Since it's a positive 2, it must be concave up the whole time. So it's concave up from negative infinity to infinity. It's concave down nowhere. On 59, though, it'll be more interesting and we'll actually get something. So 3x squared minus 6x minus 5 
is our first derivative, and then 6x minus 6 is our second. That's what we're going to set equal to 0 and solve. So I get x equals 1. I'm going to put that on my number line and have 0 and 2. I'm going to plug that back into my second derivative. So I get a negative and then a positive. And then I get concave down where it's negative, concave up where it's positive. So it's concave up from 1 to infinity, and it's concave down from negative infinity to 1. Number 60. A carpenter is building a rectangular room with a fixed perimeter of 200. So 2L plus 2W equals 200. I'm going to divide everything by 2. L plus W equals 100. And then move one of my letters over to the other side so I'm solved either for my length or my width. So length equals 100 minus W. I'm going to plug that into the area of a rectangle, length times width, and get 100 minus W times W, which will be, when I distribute, 100 W minus W squared. Then I'm going to take the derivative of this and set it equal to zero. So the derivative, which would be a prime, is 100 minus 2w. Set that equal to zero and solve. So I get 100 equals 2w. Divide by 2, w equals 50. So my width is 50. If I plug this back in to find my length, my length is 50. So my dimensions are 50 feet by 50 feet. And if I multiply that out, I get an area of 2,500 feet squared.